Welcome everybody to this um, Tea Break webinar. My name is Mafe and I'm part of the support and content team here to Flourish and I'm going to be delivering the session and we're going to be talking about heat maps. I'm going to be running an overview on our heat maps template. Um, again, as I said at the very beginning, my colleague Simona is also joining me today. She's going to be on chat duty. So if you have any questions throughout the session, please um, ask them in the chat and she's going to be covering them. I'll do my best to also take a look at it um, whenever I can, but I'll be quite busy doing all the demoing, so do bear with me. And um, yes, if you do not get the chance to ask your question or get questions later on, you can always send us an email to um, our email address, which will be in the slides. The session is being recorded and it will be uploaded to our training and webinar resources later on, so don't fret if you don't um, grasp one concept or you miss one bit of the slides, you will be able to go over them later on. And this is just a bit of the program for today, I guess. It's going to be the basics of heat maps, what are they good for and how to use them. I'm going to go over the differences between the categorical and numerical heat maps. Then I'll be covering the essentials, so what you need to build your heat maps with Flourish specifically. And then I'll be working on a hands-on exercise where I'll build a heat map from beginning to end and share some um, useful tricks and tips for you in your um, data visualization process with heat maps. And just a quick recap to go over all the bits and bobs that we'll be covering today. So um, let's jump right in with the anatomy of a heat map. So first things first, what are even heat maps? So they're essentially matrix of content that allows us to see the relationship between two variables. We have columns, which are going to be our um, y-axis. These are going to be the ticks of the y-axis. And then we have rows, which are going to be the ticks of the y-axis. Sorry, columns are going to be the x-axis and rows are going to be the y-axis. And then the intersections between the columns and the rows are going to be our cells. And these are the elements that are going to be given the heat map. Um, it's very characteristic look of all the little squares being colored in different ways and manners. And this is basically where we're going to be seeing the differences between categoricals and numerical heat maps as I'll be covering later um, in the session. But effectively, uh, every cell shows the relationship between a column and a row and the color is being driven either by a category or by a value. In this example, where I'm showing energy production by type and by region, the higher the value, the darker the cell, and we can spot different trends throughout these um, chart. So heat maps are particularly good for showcasing trends over time or trends amongst different categories, also to spot outliers. So you can see definitely that we can see general trends here on the nuclear wind and solar and biomass type of energy is not being heavily produced by any regions, but we can definitely see some outliers on this particular section right here. And as the name suggests, like heat maps are just a really good way of showing um, overview information and just like generic um, hands of information if you want. So categorical versus numerical heat maps. This is the main point um, for today's session. And it's going to be probably one of the most useful things that you need to um, always be aware of when you are creating heat maps. It's whether information is numerical or categorical. So here, categorical heat maps color the cells based on predominantly category. So you can see in my legend that I have yes, no, and maybe values, and that each of my squares of my cells is being colored based on whether that particular element belongs to that specific category. So here you're not going to see those um, uh, beautiful gradients or those color scales that are going to be more nuanced. You're going to see harsh colors and you're going to see like clear divisions between the elements. And that is what uh, you should be looking for in a categorical scale. Now, however, the sequential scale, which is being used in the numerical type heat maps, um, in this case, these cells have a value that's what's driving the color. So in this case, the higher the value, the darker the color, depending on the information that you're showcasing and what you're trying to do, you may want to perhaps reverse your scale. So um, higher values per percent in lighter color, or you may want to use a divergent scale where you're zero, your natural zero, um, it's in a lighter color, and then you go to opposite ends of the um, color wheel to showcase um, your data a bit better. Um, but in this particular case, we clearly have a sequential scale that goes from lighter to darker, and just the higher the value of the cell, the darker the color 
And we can see here um, the type of um, visualization that we'll get as a result. But now we're going to be looking into some examples so this concept um, sinks in clear. So this first example that I have right here is a categorical heat map where we're showcasing um, the type of change observed according to the IPCC report. The region where it's being observed, this is my, uh, my y-axis. So every single one of my rows is a specific region. We can see here Northeastern North America, South America, Mediterranean, et cetera. And then we have the um, categories or the values, um, sorry, rather the main categories that are being showed. So whether we can see presence of hot um, extremes, heavy precipitation, or agricultural and ecological drought. And depending on whether we see an increase, low agreement in type of change, limited data, or a decrease, we will get a specific color. So as I said before, you don't get here the nuanced colors or those gradients, you get very harsh colors, but that allow you to um, get a very quick overview of the information. So from this heat map, for instance, we can gather that a bunch of the regions have experienced hot extremes, that that's definitely the type of change observed that it's most, most pressing in all regions in the world. Um, heavy precipitation, we can see that there's limited data in quite a lot of the regions, similar for agricultural and ecological drought, that there's low agreement in type of change, so we can agree maybe that the data um, was not that conclusive, and that it's also the only one of the categories that actually showed an, a decrease, whereas all the others had actual increases. And this should move, there we go. Oh, sorry, just having a bit of an issue with my slides. But now we're moving on to numerical. So as I said before, numerical heat maps, um, the color is driven by the actual value represented in the cells. So in this example, we are representing the number of metals received in the, well, in, in the history of the Olympics, the Summer Olympics by female athletes. And we have the countries on the y-axis, then the type of event, so whether it's a team, all around, floor, balancing, vault, and uneven bars. And the darker the cell, the more metal that the country has received. So in this case, we have two categorical axes. We're having categories for our events and categories for our country. And the color is determined by the value of each of the cells. We can see here, the Soviet Union has received 56 medals in the team event. And we can compare that, for instance, to the Netherlands having only one medal on the balance team. And here in my legend, I'm actually showing bins. So rather than a continuous scale, I'm segmenting my information by bits and I'm coloring based on that. But there are other examples for um, numerical heat maps, such as this one, which is solar energy production. We can see here a bit of a difference. I'm using a sequential scale going from a very dark purple to a very bright yellow to show solar energy production. And again, I shifted my axis. Now on the Y axis, I have years. And on the X axis, I have countries. So I'm trying to compare um, with the rows, the different years, and I can see the energy production of 2017, what happened, and I can compare it, for instance, to 2018, and reveal that perhaps more countries produce more energy, we can see more yellow, and that also drives the meaning. So we can understand, for instance, that we're seeing an increase on solar energy production over time um, in this specific countries. And again, we have two categorical axes, once again, because states for heat maps and for many data um, chart types rather, are considered categories. So even though these look like numbers are considered categories, and of course the countries are categories as well. Um, another example that might be of interest to a lot of you is the use of heat maps, um, numerical heat maps like calendars. So in this case, we have the years on the X axis. So every column represents a full year. And then for the rows, so the y-axis, we have the months. So here we're comparing all data for January from 17, 1978 rather, and 2021, the sea ice extent um, in the Arctic. And basically the harder, the harder, the darker the color, um, the more sea ice, which is suggesting that um, months that are on the winter months or colder months should have more ice than the summer ones and that and it's clearly showcased by the color in this example. And again, as I mentioned, these are two categorical axes. Again, the y-axis for the months and the x-axis for the years. 
and we get this beautiful calendar view that is um, representing just changes over time and trends over time. And interesting here, you can see that lighter colors um, appear on the most recent years, and that suggests that, for instance, temperatures are getting higher and sea ice is getting, um, well, it's less and less and less in the Arctic, uh, which of course can be a consequence of climate change. So in just this very simple chart, you can get a bunch of information conveyed to your users. And I believe this is uh, my second to last example, and we'll jump right into the app to actually build our very own heat map. Uh, but this is one template that we do offer in Flourish, which are our stripe or climate stripe um, charts. This effectively is a heat map that only has an x-axis. It doesn't have a y-axis because it only conveys one value, which is the temperature for each one of these years. And in this case, I'm using a divergent scale. So the natural zero is white. And when temperature decreases, we get more blue colors. And when it increases, we get more red colors to create this urgency that um, the weather is effectively getting um, harsher and hotter and to convey this idea of just like heat and and well, yes, of climate urgency. And very similar to that, this is a filtered heat map, which draws on the same principle of hiding the y-axis, but rather now we include a filter. And so every single time I click on one of these countries, I get this striped view for all the history of the, well, the data, the surface temperature anomaly. And I get data from 1850 up until 2000. 17, if I'm not mistaken, indeed, 2017. And I can see an overview, a quick overview for each of the countries, or I can see them all together and get the general trend. And these are the essential elements that you need to build your very own heat map with Flourish. You simply need data for um, literally one of the axes. You don't even need to have two categorical columns for your X and Y, as long as you have one. Um, you will be able to render a heat map and then your values and you just need to bind that to the um, correct column binding so your x your y and your value and you can additionally add a filter and we're going to be looking into that in the app in just a second um, because now it's time to build our very own heat map so i'm just going to get out of my presentation Oop. there we go and we're going to be working with um, this data set from our rolling data for malaria incidents in 2018. Actually, we have the whole extent of the data from the year 2000 until 2018. And I just already put that into this Google Sheet right here. And we're just going to take a quick look so you see how to structure your data for heat maps specifically. So we have one column for the country. This is going to be my y axis. So I want all the countries stacked on top of each other. Then my year is going to be my X axis because I want every single one of the columns to be a specific year. So whenever I read it from left to right, I can see the country and then the progression throughout all the years. And the incidence of malaria, of course, is going to be my actual value. So what I'm going to be showing through color um, on each of the cells. So if I go to my Flourish account and just go to any visualization and I scroll down the template chooser, I'm just going to choose one of my starting points for the heat map. Um, it doesn't really matter which one you choose because you're able to arrive to the result of the climate stripes and even with the heat map with the filter, even if you select the categorical heat map. So, um, I mean, for your own comfort, you can choose whichever you want, but I'm just going to go for the categorical one. And I'll just quickly give this a name. This is going to be malaria incidents go into my data and I'm going to clear it, make sure that there's nothing in here that can interfere with my actual data. And I'm just going to select all my records and paste them here. So before I actually bind the correct um, columns to my column bindings, I just want to show you what happens when you bind the data and why is this happening? Why am I getting this very weird line right here? Well, this is happening because I'm binding the column, the col sorry, the country names as my Y clearly, and then I'm getting the code. And because the code is unique to every single one of the countries, I'm effectively getting one record per country. So it's not going to create the view of like multiple cells stacked together 
because there are no repeating records that have common categories for each one of my countries. So it's really important when you're visualizing with uh, heat map to understand really how your data is working and whether these categories are actually repeated and common to um, as many elements as possible to get that sort of grid view. Because if you don't get um, your data formatted in that manner, you're going to get um, uh, weird looking charts like this one, which is not really useful at all. So I'm just going to fix that by binding my year to my X axis and my value right here. So we can already see that this looks much better. Um, and I'm going to be fixing the colors in a second. So I'm just going to go bit by bit here on the settings panel and I'll cover um, all the relevant settings for the template. So first here, we need to select whether we are dealing with categories or numbers. By default, it's going to always select categories because we've selected the categorical heat map as a starting point. If I had numbers, I would change them right here, but that's not the case. Both the country and the year are categories, so this is actually correct. The cell padding is the separation between the rows and the columns, so are those um, little white space that make it look like almost like tiles. I personally rather um, have them either set to one or even to zero because they're much more, if especially if they're going to be colored in a sequential color scale, I find them much more readable when they're merged together. So I'll, I'm actually just going to go ahead and set that to zero. And we can see they're blending much better right now. And then we have the hide mode. So the hide mode is probably going to be one of the uh, most important settings whenever you're dealing with heat maps in Flourish, because obviously um, it's going to allow you to set a view for how you want your heat map to look when it, once it is embedded. And let's start with the fill space. So fill space is effectively going to squish your heat map as much as you can to fit the actual um, size of the canvas. And always remember that this is going to be applied to the size of the canvas you have when you embed the chart, not necessarily what you have here on the preview mode. So do keep that in mind. But you can see that if I move my, if I change the size of my canvas, it's trying to resize as much as it can. If I increase this frame lens to 800 pixels, it will try, there we go, it will try and to fit that space. Then we have the cell aspect, which I always need to remember exactly what these mean because cell height and cell aspect are similar settings, but they affect the cells differently. So of course, cell height refers to the actual height of my cell. So if I increase this, I should be getting higher cells. But that is not happening for whatever reason. So I'm just going to refresh very quickly. There we go. So you can see that with the cell height, if I increase it, I'm going to get, of course, higher cells. This may work better and well if you have few data, like less data than I have in this moment. But because I do have quite a lot of records, this is not very effective. So let's just give it a go and test 0 0.5. That looks much better. And you can see that it keeps resizing to keep the 0 0.5 proportion. Whereas the cell aspect is going to try and basically correlate the aspect of like the width and the height. So if I go for one, I should be getting squares because it's going to be a one-to-one -one relationship to the width of the cell and the height of the cell. And if I go for a higher number, so again, five, I should be getting wider cells and shorter ones. So for now, I'm just going to change it to actually to fill space and let it like this. And then I'm moving on to the colors. So in this case, as I explained before, we're not dealing with categories, we're dealing with numbers. So I need to clearly change this to numeric. And I first get this view, which is much closer to what I'm trying to achieve. Um, so for heat maps, it's colors is particularly important. You need to understand what your data is trying to tell you. You need to select colors that actually reflect that meaning. Um, in this case, um, I'm going to go for an actual palette that's more aggressive. So for the rest, you can reverse it if your data calls for it. In this case, it makes no sense because I'm representing number of cases. So of course I want um, the least amount of cases to be um, on a lighter shade, whereas I want more cases to be on a darker shade. Um, in this case, it's not going to work, but if I had a natural zero splitting my data into positive and negatives or with a cl clear threshold in the middle, I could use a divergent color scale to separate the elements that are above that threshold and the elements that are below that threshold. But as I said, um, this doesn't apply to my particular data, so I'm just with it like this. 
And you can also change the domain. So this is um, from where and where to your data is going to. So for instance, if I do this with costume, and it used to be an 800, if I set this to be 400, my colors are effectively going to understand that 400 is the maximum quantity or amount in my data, and they're going to color accordingly. If you feel comfortable dealing with your own um, custom-made scales, by all means, like do so, but this can actually be a point of conflict when you're dealing with a bunch of data because the type of scale that you choose and how you split it can affect how it's represented. So I would advise um, caution if you don't feel comfortable dealing with different scales and so on. And now that I have this view and that this is looking correct, but at the same time slightly weird, it's a good moment to go back into my data tab and tell you that you can actually sort this data however you want. Because we're dealing with categories, um, we need to be very careful. So for instance, I noticed that this is being rendered alphabetically, but that is really not useful because it doesn't matter to me um, that countries starting by A are at the top and countries starting by Z are at the bottom. It matters to me um, what are the clusters in my data, right? So I'm trying to reveal trends. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to sort this descendingly so I get the highest values at the top. And this is already given a clear review because I'm going to be grouping countries with the higher amount of cases at the top and the ones with less amount of cases at the bottom. And this already gives me a clear view of what my data is trying to tell me. But I noticed that my years are um, incorrect. And this is because as I mentioned, they are a category. So the chart is not understanding that they are ordered chronologically. So what I need to do is that I need to sort this yet again. And there we go. Now I have my years correctly um, sorted from 2000 to 2008, but I kept the order of the countries descendingly on number of cases. So I still have a cluster of higher cases at the top and it's lighter at the bottom because of the lack of cases. And as I mentioned, this is already giving me a much better view of what my data is trying to tell me. So now moving on to the legend, you can enable it or disable it. I would always recommend to have it enabled specifically, like especially with heat maps, given that you have so many values and you're having like such a wide view of information. You can change all the settings right here, similar to any other first chart. I'm not going to be touching on any of these. And for the axis, the main point that you may want to um, change or edit in the case of the x-axis particularly is whether you have it at the top or at the bottom or even hidden if it's not serving any purpose in your case. In this one, it is, so I'm just going to put it to the top. Um, you can also flip it. In this case, I could show the latest years to the left and the oldest ones to the right, but I'm just going to let it as it is. And you can change the color of the labels and the size of the labels. I'm just going to set them to black, make them slightly smaller. The padding is going to change the separation between the tick and the actual label. So if I set it, for instance, to 0 0.1 closer and I change my tick line, again, I'll just set it to 0 0.15 so they're closer and I'm getting rid of the axis line. Grids, in this case, you're not going to be able to see them because they're behind all of my cells, but you can set them to on or off. And I'm going to apply the same settings to the Y axis. Very quickly here. Again, to black, this is 0 0.7. And no acid line. And actually, I'm going to keep the axes, the ticks a bit longer, but I'm going to set them to a width of zero. There we go. So I get a little bit of padding in there. And this is effectively a, could be a finished product. I can definitely keep messing with the hide mode so I can reveal more or less countries here on the Y axis. Um, that is really an issue of trial and error. You need to just test this with your side and see how it's embedded and how it's looking and different hide modes to make sure you're representing all the information that you want. Um, the last bit that I did want to show you is that I can also add a control of filter right here. So if I go to my data tab and select the year to filter and include all of them, now I effectively can take a look to just one single year at a time and I can evaluate 
you know, what kind of information this is telling me. And in that case, you also have the settings for animations. This is what's activated on the, on the climate stripes. So for instance, when I change this into 2000, I'm going to get a little um, fade effect, or if I change to flip, I would get that effect as well. There you go. In this case, I don't find it particularly useful, but it's definitely good to know that it's there so you can use it um, if it fits your particular narrative. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into my presentation, which is here. And I'm just going to quickly refresh this because we're going to embed our final visualization into a Canva presentation in case you haven't gotten a chance to see this um, demo before. It's going to go right here as clearly suggested. So when you go into Canva, you only need to find the Flourish plugin and you actually can go here and search for Canva apps and you should search for, search for Flourish. That should automatically populate this field right here. And you should be seeing your visualizations right here. And it's important to notice that they don't have to be public in order for you to see them here in Canva. Um, the only disadvantage of them not being public is that you don't get a thumbnail that's a bit more revealing than just the title. But nevertheless, we have our chart right here. Just going to move this very quickly so I can stage it as they want. There we go. And I'm just going to set that to be at the background so I can see my arrow. And there you go, that's the finished product right there. If I double click on it, I can interact. You do get pop-ups and panels with heat maps and you're able to edit those as you would any other Flourish visualization. And now you can see how it works interactively with the Canva presentation as well. And before I do the recap, I notice I have not seen the chat and I am, well, almost out of time. So I'm just going to quickly go and read and see if there are any pressing issues that you guys have been asking about. Um, it looks like Simona handled every single one of those. So that's amazing. And yes, I mean, just to conclude is that heat maps are a great way of showing relationships of two variables and for uncovering trends. Um, oops, sorry, these should say heat map rather than slope. That is my bad. But yes, heat maps need data for one axis and columns or values. I mean, they're pretty simple in terms of the type of data um, that they need. You can see that you only need one single column and one for the values, and that's about it. And you can add an extra one for either your y and your x axis to make it more complex than a filter. And that heat, map, heat maps can be either numerical or categorical. And as for resources, we do have a couple of health docs on. Um, on heat maps, but also there's documentation on the actual templates. I'm just going to show you this very quickly if I can. Yes. And whenever you are in a Flourish template, I'm just going to show you that in the app itself, and you click on the name of the template that is going to open this, this, like this view of the template, which actually has a bunch of documentation at the bottom. Here we go over um, different information, like what is it for, how to get started, the type of data that it needs. So um, it's always useful to take a look at this information before when you're trying to understand how a template works and how it can adapt to your use cases in particular. And yes, you can access this particular link as I showed you go, by going to your visualization and selecting on the name of the template, but it's also linked on this slide right here. So you can access that. And now I'm going to take a look at whether there are any further questions. How to place two heat maps side by side. Um, yes, so that is possible through a handy little hack that we have found. I'm going to just show that very quickly. Let's see. So the way to do that would be, yes, there we go. Here's a good example of that. Um, so this is our table template, actually. 
But if I go to the data tab, I can see that I have two iframes or two visualizations that are being embedded um, on top of each other. So in this particular case, what you would have to do, and we have a help doc on it that I'm sure I can find a link for you if Simona can get there faster than I can, um, is that you would basically have to create the visualizations you're trying to embed in any sort of like grid format. So it can be side by side, um, top to bottom, et cetera. And you would have to then publish the visualization and generate an iframe embed code, which is this one right here. And here you would have to change your width and your height to fit, um, well, however you want it to fit, however you want it to look in your table. And then you simply position them either next to each other, as I said, top to bottom. Um, but I'm pretty sure there is a help talk on this. I'm just going to go and fetch that, which should be um, how to, there you go. So how to embed charts side by side. So I hope that answered that question. Um, could you post the links here? Yes, so all the links are going to be um, posted on the resources page after the webinar is over, as well as the recording. And just going back to that point with on the side by side embedding, so you can see here how these are working. These are three separate slopes. They don't have to be the same chart type. You can do, for instance, a map, a line chart, et cetera. And yes, you have all the steps outlined right here. And if there are no more questions, then that's it for me. Our next webinar is going to be on the 26th of April, and it's about how to flourish a data storytelling, pardon the pun. Um, do register if you're interested in taking a look into how to go further with your own um, data storytelling and data visualization practices, how you can tell stories with data and just excel at um, yeah, your chart making journey. And if you do have any questions, please, again, email us at support at Flourish Studio. Thank you very much. Again, all this is going to be in our webinar resources page that probably Simona has already shared with you. But just in case, if you go to Flourish Studio resources webinar, you will have the table of the upcoming sessions right here. And hopefully between today and tomorrow, um, this recording is going to be appearing right here in this um, cards template. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope this was useful and entertaining and yeah, can't wait to see your heat maps out in the wild. <laughs>